Right-wing conspiracy theorist Alex Jones says he pleaded the Fifth Amendment almost 100 times during a meeting on Monday with the House Committee investigating the January 6th insurrection. Through some of its interviews, that committee is learning new information about who was behind the Capitol attack. On Face the Nation Sunday, the panel's chairman, Congressman Benny Thompson, said the committee is looking into a draft executive order to seize voting machines following the 2020 election. One-time Trump legal team member Bernard Carrick said the administration considered the idea in order to preserve evidence. For the latest on the investigation, I want to bring in Catherine Herridge and Scott McFarlane. Catherine is a CBS News senior investigative correspondent. Scott is a CBS News congressional correspondent. Welcome. Good to see you both. So, Scott, Stuart Rhodes, the leader of the right-wing paramilitary Oath Keepers group, was in court facing charges of seditious conspiracy today. What can you tell us about his and the other uh, so-called Oath Keepers cases? They were all formally arraigned, nearly a dozen of them, on a charge of seditious conspiracy, that provocative high-level charge, the top-line charge so far in the more than 700 federal criminal cases. Rhodes pleaded not guilty, appearing virtually at the hearing at the D.C. federal courthouse. So, too, did his co-defendants. That's what we know. The mystery that remains right now is what becomes of Stuart Rhodes until trial? He had his hearing earlier this week at the federal courthouse in Plano, Texas, and a judge didn't decide on the spot whether to release Rhodes from pretrial detention to stay with someone else, to stay with a family member or a third party, or whether to hold him in jail. That's a big question. There are several dozen January 6 defendants, including those facing lesser charges than seditious conspiracy, who are in pretrial detention. According to my reporting, nearly 40 of them right here in Washington, D.C., at the D.C. jail. We should know more about Stuart Rhodes and his pretrial detention, likely by some, sometime tomorrow. And Scott, remind us, who are some of the notable people who have testified in front of the January 6th committee in recent weeks, and who might be appearing in the coming weeks? Well, this January 6th committee has told us a number of criminal defendants in this case have spoken to them and given them good information. We know several Trump aides, top staff, have spoken with the January 6th committee, people who know what was in the president's orbit, what the president was hearing in the weeks before January 6th. Stuart Rhodes, defense attorney, tells me he's likely to appear to talk to the January 6th committee somehow, some way, logistically, the first week of February. We also know the committee is seeking a voluntary interview with Ivanka Trump that same week, February 3rd. All of that a prelude to what's likely to be the first set of prime time public hearings from this committee sometime in March, where a committee member tells me they'll reveal some of what they found, but also have witnesses or some other mechanism to keep probing, to look for new information. So as the committee moves closer and deeper into the inner circle of former President Trump, they're seeking a voluntary interview from Ivanka Trump, and they are subpoenaing other key figures, from Rudy Giuliani to attorneys Jenna Ellis, Sidney Powell, and of course we know the subpoenas have gone to Mark Meadows, and a possible criminal prosecution for contempt of Congress still remains a possibility, but we haven't yet heard from the Justice Department. So, Catherine, uh, just to follow up on what Scott was talking about there, so former Trump strategist Steve Bannon is the most <laughs> prominent figure not cooperating. He's been indicted for contempt of Congress. Is anyone else facing that? Well, Elaine, the big question mark is whether the former chief of staff, Mark Meadows, will get a criminal referral for contempt by the Justice Department. It's been in front of them, that issue, for about five weeks now. And this is a tough call, based on my reporting here at CBS, because Meadows adopted what a number of the former Trump aides have adopted, which is a policy and a strategy of limited cooperation. And what that means is that they provided some records or they provided short interviews with the committee. And that's made it a harder call. So we're talking about people like Meadows. We're also talking about Cash Patel, a former presidential aide. We're also talking about Keith Kellogg, who was a former national security advisor to Vice President Pence. So providing some, but not all of the information the select committee 
demands from these witnesses has also provided them sort of a legal shield to avoid that criminal contempt indictment by the Justice Department, Elaine. And, Catherine, what have you learned about the potential plot involving the military seizure mm -hmm. of voting machines in the immediate days after the 2020 election? What are witnesses mm -hmm. saying about this, and what's their strategy? Well, based on our reporting, Elaine, here at CBS News, Bernard Carrick, who was a member of Mr. Trump's legal team and also a former New York City police commissioner, has told select committee investigators that they did discuss this plan to have the military seize the ballot box. But he also told investigators that it didn't get very far. It was dismissed by a senior Homeland Security official and Mr. Trump himself. And when you follow that further, which we did with our reporting, the question is, was there buy-in into this plan by the Justice Department and then also the Department of Defense? And what we've also learned here at CBS News is that the former acting secretary of defense Chris Miller first learned about these discussions involving the military and the seizure of ballot boxes from the media. It was not brought to him when he was leading the Pentagon at that time, and we learned similar information from Attorney General Barr. There was no comment from the select committee on these matters. But I would emphasize there's an additional layer, I think, that's been added on to the entire investigation in recent days, and that's the release of the records from the National Archives. That creates new legal jeopardy for some of these witnesses. What they testified, does it sync up now with the records the select committee has? Or does it not sync up and lead them open to allegations they misled the committee or maybe even lied to Congress, which is a federal offense, Elaine? Well, Scott, over 100 members of Congress refused to certify the election and acknowledge President Biden's 2020 win. How have the events of January 6th already been the catalyst for political action across the nation? Well, you have what's really formed a political schism here. You've got people, elected lawmakers, both at the state level and the federal level, who find it politically advantageous to continue to deny the scope and size of the January 6th Capitol attack and the validity of the 2020 election. In fact, you'll see this in political primaries, in campaigns where you have candidates who take a side as a way to outflank other people in their own party. That manifested itself, of course, the night of January 6th with the vote, the vote by dozens and dozens of federal lawmakers to not accept the electoral count to challenge the vote. But you're also going to see that moving forward in this election cycle, where you see candidates not only take a stance against the 2020 election and its validity, and January 6th against its significance, but to promote that view. One example, the New York gubernatorial race. One of the first Republican candidates, primary candidates, is the elected sheriff of Lewis County, New York, who just wrote a letter on official county letterhead seeking leniency for one of the January 6th defendants and who owns that decision and wanted to talk about it. There are political advantageous situations for some candidates talking about January 6th and still talking about November 2020. Hmm. Well, Catherine, what more have we learned about what was going on inside the Trump White House on January 6th? Well, Elaine, there are really two streams of information. Uh, first and foremost, there's a now public letter from the Select Committee where they ask for Ivanka Trump's cooperation. They want her cooperation because of her firsthand witnessing of the events inside the White House on January 6th, specifically some conversations in the Oval Office. Was there a reluctance by the president to condemn the violence? And what kind of pressure was put on then-Vice President Mike Pence to stop the certification of the Electoral College? Separately, through my reporting at CBS News, I've learned through a former White House advisor that there was considerable pressure placed on the vice president because they believe Mr. Trump was given very bad legal advice and assessments about what was allowed under the Constitution on the certification, and wrongly believing that the vice president had the authority to reject the result on January 6th. So those are the types of issues that we understand are at play inside the White House. And again, these National Archive records are like a paper trail, a roadmap as to what was being communicated, sort of the hours and the minutes of that day. And again, is it consistent 
or does it conflict with previous testimony, again, opening up more legal jeopardy for some of these witnesses? So many open mm -hmm. questions. Catherine Harridge and Scott McFarland, thank you both very much.